In this video, we describe crystal field theory for octahedral complexes. Uh, the goal in the next few videos is to try to understand some of the properties of transition metal complexes. And it turns out that, uh, for example, if you think about the shape of those complexes, uh, simple theories like VSCPR fail to capture the shape of those molecules. Right, so we have to uh, de derive here a new theory, uh, which is fairly simple, uh, but it uses orbital arguments. Okay, so here's the idea. Generally, uh, when we think about transition metal chemistry, uh, the d orbitals of uh, the transition metal are involved. Right, so it's actually very instructive to remember what the shapes of those uh, d orbitals are. That's what we have here uh, to the right hand side. There are five uh, d orbitals, and uh, they are degenerate. Uh, in general, they have, uh, or in principle, they have exactly the same energy. But their shapes and their alignment are slightly different. The DC squared orbital uh, is aligned uh, along the z axis and it has this shape. And then we have the dx squared minus y squared orbital, in which uh, you have this shape. And the important thing here is that the lobes of the orbital are aligned with the x and y axis. Okay, notice that the DC squared is aligned along the z axis, and dx squared y squared is aligned along the x and y axis. And then you have a set of three other orbitals, which are the x, y, x, z, and, and y, z, which are in either the x, y, x, z, or y, z planes. But notice that uh, they're not pointing along the axis direction. Instead, they are bisecting uh, these angles between uh, those axes. Notice the difference between the x squared, y squared, and the other three, right? Uh, they're all uh, in a plane that uh, the x, y squared, y squared is the one that points along uh, the axis. Right, so now what we're going to try to see is how uh, this is important to understand octahedral complexes. Right, so in octahedral complexes, what we'll have is that there will be a transition metal uh, in the center of the octahedron, and then the ligands, there will be six of them, uh, they will be distributed uh, along the vertices of an octahedron. Right, so let's uh, see if we can draw here the octahedron. Okay, so that would be the transition metal right in the center, and here we'll have uh, this shape. All right, and then there will be a vertex here at the bottom, and you'll have that shape as well here. All right, so that will be your octahedron with the transition metal uh, right in the center, and then you're going to have a ligand in each one of the ver vertices of this octahedron. Okay, so here's the key of crystal field theory. Uh, notice that uh, we're always assuming that the bonding between the transition metal and the ligand is set uh, as, or it can be characterized by a Lewis acid base interaction in which the transition metal um, is an electron acceptor and the ligand is an, electro an electron donor. Right, so the two electrons of the bond are donated by the ligand, and then what you have here is a coordinate covalent bond. Okay, so uh, because the ligands uh, are always going to have these lo uh, lone pairs that participate in the bonding, uh, a good approximation to understand a little bit of, of uh, how the orbital structure turns out to be uh, from this model is to assume uh, that those ligands act as negative charges. Right? And again, that is due to these uh, lone pair of electrons that you have right there. Right, so uh, what we have is a transition metal, which has these uh, uh, d orbitals. And now you have six negative charges uh, uh, in the vertices of the octahedron. Right, so uh, notice that uh, it is easy then to see that uh, these two orbitals, which are the dc squared and the x squared y, uh, y squared, right, because they're pointing right along uh, the ligands are going to experience uh, a repulsion from the uh, electrons of these negative charts that we're providing to that uh, to that ligand, and their energy is going to go up. However, this uh, set of three orbitals, right, they're not pointing directly to any of the ligands, and what that means is that uh, they will experience uh, uh, less uh, ele electronic repulsion, and then uh, they will be a little bit more stable. Right, so here's something important then. It turns out that because the ex uh, repulsions experienced by uh, these two orbitals and those three orbitals are different, once you have ligands near that transition metal, 
then uh, the energies of those 5D orbitals are no longer going to be the same. Those orbitals will not be the gamut. Okay, and we can try to draw here a diagram to explain that. So this will be uh, the energy of the 5D orbitals uh, when the transition metal is by itself in the gas phase. Those energies are going to be degenerate. But then when you start to bring in ligands, uh, all of the energies, all of the, all of the, all of the orbitals experience repulsion from uh, those long pairs of the ligands, right? So all of the energies go up. But the energies, the dc squared and dx squared minus y squared uh, are more destabilized because they're pointing right along the ligands and the energies of the dxy, dxz, and dyz are not so dest destabilized because they're not pointing uh, right along the ligands, right? So you can change this picture uh, to something that looks like this, right? You will have here your uh, three uh, orbitals, dxy, dxz, and dyz, and then the two orbitals, uh, dxy minus uh, squared minus y squared, dc squared. And this actually, these orbitals actually received a different name. Uh, we're going to call these the T2Gs, and these are called the EGs. Now, the difference in energy between uh, the T2G and the EGs is what we call the splitting, and we uh, give it a, a designation uh, delta. All right, so it turns out that uh, the gap or the splitting between the T2G set of the orbitals and the EG uh, set of the orbitals depends on the ligand. And there's two uh, limiting cases here. One of them is that in which the gap between the T2G and the EG is large, and then we call this the strong field. And then uh, the weak field would be uh, that in which the gap between the T2Gs and the EGs is much smaller. And this is important. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna call we're gonna call this weak field. And this is important because the properties of the complex uh, or the molecule are going to depend on whether the orbital structure is like this, or the orbital structure looks more like this limiting case. For example, let's assume that you actually have uh, six electrons in these V orbitals. But in this strong field case, uh, the electron occupation would be something like this. That would be the first electron, second, third. And now the question is, well, where does the four electron go? Well, if uh, the gap between the uh, EG and the T2G is very large, then uh, uh, you actually, it's, it's of lower energy to put the fourth electron uh, in this orbital with antiparallel spin than to put it up there. Okay, but if you actually have a weak field uh, in this complex, then uh, putting the electron in the fourth uh, in this EG orbital, the fourth electron in this EG orbital, is actually uh, of lower energy than trying to pair it up with an antiparallel spin in that uh, T2G orbital. Right, so for six electrons, what you would have is that in the case of a strong field, that would be uh, the electronic configuration, and then for the weak field, you will have something like this. There is the properties of these two. Uh, complexes are going to be very different. This uh, is a complex that is uh, diamagnetic, no magnetic properties because all of the electronic spins are paired. And in this case, uh, you actually have a paramagnetic complex because uh, there's unpaired spins. All right, so uh, again, notice that that is going to be uh, quite different. Right, so the question then is, well, what determines whether a particular transition metal uh, in an optical complex uh, exhibits a weak field uh, type of uh, orbital diagram, a strong field, or a weak field? Well, it turns out that actually depends on the ligands. Okay, so some ligands uh, give rise to a strong field type of uh, diagram, and some other ligands uh, give rise to a weak field, right? So uh, there's actually something that we call a spectrochemical series, which tells you uh, what ligands provide more uh, or stronger field, and what ligands provide weaker field. And that spectrochemical series is like this. Uh, you have here cyanide provides a very strong field, uh, much as a uh, carbonyl ligand does, and that is a little larger than a nitro ligand. Okay. And this uh, is a little larger than the ethylene diamine ligand, a little larger than ammonia or amine ligand, 
This is a little larger than water, a little larger than hydroxo, and then the halogens. So here you will have fluoride, chloride, or fluoro, chloro, bromo, and iodo ligand. Okay, so again, this will be uh, the ligands that cause the strong field and uh, provide this type of orbital uh, diagram. And these are the ones that provide a weak field. Okay. Right, so in the following videos, we're going to see how this orbital structure changes uh, if you have, say, a tetrahedral complex or complexes of different shape. And then we'll also do a few examples to show uh, how, uh, uh, when you have combinations of these ligands, right? So suppose that of these six ligands that you have in this tetrahedral complex, you have maybe uh, two of, uh, uh, that are strong, uh, two that are intermediate, uh, two that are weak. The question is how do we make choices about whether you have this occupation or that electronic occupation.